It's Friday, October 20th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. Oh boy, it is a hell of a day to talk ball. I don't know if like the coffee just finally caught up or if it was a wonderful pre-show chat with my co-host today, but I'm, I'm ready to talk ball. It is a fantastic day to talk ball and joining me to do just that is Kate Majuk. Kate, welcome back to the show. What's going on? Thanks for having me back. I'm excited. We've got a, a fun preview this week. And you know what? We can really dive into the the few good matchups that we have because we don't have as many as we usually do. We have six teams on by this week, which means we're going to have to give some really, really good advice because there are a lot of injuries. There are a lot of players yes. out on by. This is like a crucial, crucial week for, for fantasy managers and their decision making. So hopefully we help the audience make their most difficult decisions as we talk through this game slate. Yes. In some ways I cheated you or like gave you a break. It depends on how you look at it by bringing you on the preview episode where there are six teams on by, <laughs> um, like in one sense you'd be like, okay, well we can breeze through this and maybe even pull some threads out on some of these good games. Like you said, there's not a ton of good games, but the real good games, you can pull the threads out on the other hand, Kate, you could say like, Yo, Harmon, what a jackass. You brought me on like the the hardest episode because like there's so many players wiped off the slate. We got to discuss some real deep. low tiers. Deep, deep dives this week. Like we're, th this is not going to be a pretty week for your fantasy teams. This is going to feel uh, probably not great uh, for, for any of us because we're going to have to start some players that are kind of ick, kind of gross, but that doesn't mean that we, we can't still eke out some wins. It, it's fine. Let's. Let's dive as deep as we possibly can into some of these kind of meh, kind of interesting matchups and the circumstances that come with them because we're we're in for a weird week, I think. Yeah, we're in for a weird week. Let's call it a gritty week. Like this is where you're going to have to be yes. a gritty fantasy manager. You're going to get scrappy. down in the dirt. You're going to really scrappy, really scrape mm -hmm. the bottom of the barrel for potential good plays. So let's waste no more time. Let's jump into the Week 7 Fantasy Football Viewer's Guide. Reminder for how this works if you are new to the show. The games you want to binge, those are like the shows you can't miss. You're watching as soon as they're live. You might just crush all those episodes in one weekend. The games you want to stream, those are the shows that you certainly want to watch start to finish, but perhaps you're finishing it over the course of like a few weeks as opposed to a few days. Those matchups are, they, they could kind of go either way from a fantasy football perspective and an NFL perspective to me. Lastly, the games you want to skip. I mean, I, I don't. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You're probably leaning on passing on these shows. Um, you might catch an episode here or there. You, you might just stick to reading the the memes and the recaps to to stay with the culture, if that makes sense. So let's jump right into it here. The binge category. Uh, this game maybe not a maybe maybe it doesn't appear as the most sexy on the slate, Kate, but. I think Detroit Lions at Baltimore Ravens. Ravens are three-point home favorites, 42 and a half over under. Uh, I'm not sure how deep we can scrape to get some really good plays out of this one, but I do think these are two really, really good teams. These are two of the best teams in the NFL, two of the best teams in their respective conferences. The Detroit Lions at five and one, their only loss came to the Seahawks in overtime. Like, this is an underrated team, despite how good they are and despite all of the stats backing them up. Like the, the Detroit Lions are red hot, but the Baltimore Ravens, they've been getting healthier. I know they're they're coming off a loss of, from my Pittsburgh Steelers, which uh, still trying to figure out how that that one happened. It probably came on the back of those seven drops from from the wide receivers. Um, it, it was a gross day, but like this, these are these are two very good teams and I think, you know what is probably the quickest talking point? The Detroit Lions uh, depth at running back because you've got yeah. Jameer Gibbs. You've got David Montgomery, who's going to miss time. You have Craig Reynolds, uh, who would probably be backing up Jameer Gibbs, uh, dealing with a toe and hamstring injury. And Jameer Gibbs, not even necessarily a lock to, to be uber efficient, right? He's missed the last two weeks with a hamstring injury. I like is de it's Detroit going to throw the ball 60, 70, 80 times in this game based on where they're at with the running backs. That's actually a really good point, because I think this team can play and this is how you know they're a good team. They can play in multiple phases, right? Like if they want to have a power run game and, and saddle David Montgomery up with like 30 plus carries and win a game, we've literally seen them do that. Then last week, as David Montgomery goes down, 
pretty early into the proceedings. They can drop back to pass and they've got a good offensive line. Uh, Jared Goff is kind of like nobody wants to admit that Jared Goff is just like playing really good football. It's like, yeah, he's playing out of his mind. He should be I like this is going to be the grossest thing I say on this podcast. I'm going to get it out of the way very quickly. But (laughs) good idea. Jared Goff (laughs) should be like discussed in the MVP conversation. And like the, the fact that, you know, we have we have Patrick Mahomes, who I think is is obviously playing as good a football as you could expect for him. But like he mm-hmm. will talk about Patrick Mahomes in this MVP conversation without any question uh, regarding yeah. how well he's actually We'll be doing playing. that for the rest of time. We'll, we'll, he will always be discussed. Yeah. And I get it. Like, I totally get it. But in that same vein, we actually need to talk about somebody who's playing lights out out of his mind. And, you know, now he's got Amon R. St. Brown and Jamison Williams to take things over the top. You've got a, a outstanding rookie tight end and Sam Laporta. Now, like this whole offense is absolutely incredible, but a lot of that is funneled through Jared Goff, who's been one of the most delightful surprises. He's, uh, I think, the quarterback six in fantasy this year. My only concern, the home road splits, which have not been pretty. They're a little bit better this year than they were last year, but mm-hmm. You still look at Jared Goff, and he's not necessarily got the highest ceiling. Just under 23 fantasy points per game at home. Just under 16 fantasy points per game on the road. Um, Now, like, this isn't a great matchup. I don't think Baltimore's necessarily a matchup you can't beat. They They haven't faced a ton of really outstanding quarterbacks. They got Joe Burrow when he definitely wasn't healthy. Garter Minshew, Kenny Pickett. Like, there's not a great, uh, you know, sampling of quarterbacks that they've faced that they've really been tested by, but this is a really good defense. So like Jared Goff yeah. on the road against a solid Baltimore defense. That's only getting healthier as the year goes on. How, are, how are they going to match up? Cause I could see this either being a, a great game, a high passing volume game for Jared Goff, but I could also picture this being like a, you know, 253 yards for, one passing touchdown, three interception kind of game. Right. 42 and a half point total. I could see it going slightly over or even a little bit under that total, too, because you mentioned the Ravens defense. They're number two in EPA per play allowed. The Lions are seventh like this. That's a story about the Lions that I feel like we're still not talking about enough. Naturally, we're talking about all the offensive players on a, on a fantasy show, of course. But like that defense is turned around, even though they've suffered injuries in the secondary. And um, I expected Tampa Bay to be able to throw a little bit better on them last week and granted it's Baker Mayfield who's like the king of volatility Um, I think Lamar Jackson is a much better player and I think has not gotten enough credit for how well he's played in isolation this year but this is still a pretty tough matchup overall I think both of these two defenses could have this game being something like you know 20 to 17 uh, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Right. And and in that case, we're not going to get a ton of like fantasy juice necessarily. But I still think there are good spots to pick. Like you bring up a good point with Jameer Gibbs, where at least in week two, we saw them saddle him with 17 carries. He had 80 yards like the success rate was not as high as it was when Dave Montgomery plays like there is a difference. I don't care what the box score says. There's a difference between Jameer Gibbs and Dave Montgomery. We've talked about that a lot with Austin Eckler on Eckler's edge and like the difference between those two backs. That said, if you are looking for a guy like Jameer Gibbs to start on your fantasy team, I, I think even though it's, again, it's probably not a great matchup, this is a good uh, situation for him. What's your level of trust with Jamison Williams right now? Because I think, yeah, your face is, for the YouTube folks, your face is saying it perfectly. Whereas, <laughs> like, the level of trust is, because uh, I know he had the long touchdown, but I'm not there yet from a playing time perspective. No, and that is something, like, it, I think, Jamison Williams is great for Jared Goff. I think Jamison mm. Williams is great for this offense. The mere threat of him being on the field with that speed and, and explosive ability to make plays, that changes the defensive dynamics that that you're gaming planning for. Like that, that just changes the way you approach this offense in its entirety when you're game planning for defense. Now, what he can do like in isolation. I'm not trusting that just yet. I don't know that um, the volume is going to be there. I don't know that the, the route participation is necessarily going to be as high as you would like it to be in comparison to some other, um, you know, other viable fantasy assets. 
and I'm going to be honest, like this matchup, you know, some sometimes you're willing to say, forget it. You know, I know the the workload's risky, but, you know, the matchup's too juicy. I know he's going to break one off. This isn't necessarily a matchup where I think, okay, he's he's definitely got to break one off in this right. game. It, you know, I, I think the Ravens are playing better defense than than, you know, even most people are giving them credit for, despite the fact that they're a known, well, uh, you know, a, a known solid defense. Um, I I don't love the matchup. I don't think there's a high enough ceiling here in this game based on how I'm projecting game script in order to justify taking a shot. Like, I think there are other dart throws here with maybe some better matchups that might not have the sexy name value as Jamison Williams does. Feels like a... 15 16 target Amon Ross St. Brown game to me. Yes. Um real quick which I wouldn't wouldn't mind. Real quick on the um Ravens side of it here. I feel like the Ravens are pretty cut and dry, right? Like we're playing Lamar Jackson, we're playing Zay Flowers. We got the first touchdown of his career last week, but I still think overall um there's even more meat to scrape off that bone. Mark Andrews is Mark Andrews and the running backs are like I just I don't think you can no. play them. This is a horrible matchup, and I, they're, they're so split down the middle, too. You brought up a fantastic point. I, like, when we're talking about the Lions and some, you know, some of the narratives there, like, last season, the Lions were the offense that you wanted to target for pretty much any matchup in fantasy, but that's not been the case whatsoever so far this season. Um, I have allowed just 10 fantasy points per game to the running back position. Um like one of the best rushing defenses in the league right now, um, playing kind of out of their mind, uh, opposing running backs getting at just over three yards per carry to this defense, uh, it, averaging just 47 rushing yards allowed to the running back position. This isn't a good matchup anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, you know, you hear Lions and you think bad defense, but that they've really flipped that on its head. And with the way that this, this workload has been split between these two running backs, I don't think either of them are a viable play, even if you are relatively desperate in week seven. Yeah. You got to be pretty desperate. And then you're just kind of hoping that Gus Edwards pops in a touchdown for you at that point. Uh, You know, so fingers crossed on that one. They were an inefficient offense last week in London in the red zone. We'll see if they can turn that around. All right, let's move to the next game here. Speaking of a bad defense, the L.A. Chargers have a bad defense. I think mm-hmm. we can agree with that, even if what mm-hmm. we saw on Monday night. Um, are they bad enough to fix what ails the Kansas City Chiefs? The Chiefs are five and a half point favorites at home. Uh, the over under is forty seven and a half. Before we get bogged down with Chiefs receiver talk, Kate, can we just <laughs> take a minute to talk about like how I don't know what your expectations were for Isaiah Pacheco coming into the season, but I sure as hell didn't think, even though I really like the player. I sure as hell did not think that we were going to be sitting here in week seven. And I'm like, you know who we just probably don't even need to talk about at all because he's just like a set and forget guy, especially in this matchup. Number 10, the new number 10 on the Kansas City Chiefs, <laughs> Isaiah Pacheco. He's I, like, it, it's kind of funny, honestly, though, because you see the box score and that's one thing. And then you see him play and you're like, what a unique runner. He's he's so interesting to watch play football interesting Um, is the right way to say it (laughs) right like he doesn't look like a normal running back he looks like um i I don't know if you guys are are friends fans but um for any friends fans out there the moment sensitive subject but the moment where phoebe's running and she just looks like a buffoon like every time i see isaiah pacheco run i think of that scene from friends and it's not in a bad way um, because, you know what, he's he's really good and he runs with so much passion, so much fire. I do think you said it and forget it. Um, and I mean, I, I don't really see there being any sort of threat in this backfield for the, the touches that he's going to see. Um, yeah, I, I think like let's not overcomplicate it. I, Isaiah Pacheco, you start him. And like it, I, I think he's kind of one of these guys that doesn't really matter the matchup he's he's in your lineup especially based on that workload and um the upside you know this offense has when it's playing to its full potential which it hasn't so far this year and on that note with the full potential part of it obviously that comes in the passing game uh Mm i i'm like kind of running out of things to say here with the kansas city (laughs) chiefs wide receivers right like it's sort of the same story every week rasheed rice though uh, where are you at with Rasheed Rice? Because he's not like 
it's it's not the same thing with Jamison Williams, but we do need more route participation for him to be like an every week trusted guy. I would prefer to see more of those routes he's getting targeted on, like different routes. I've talked about this a lot, but it's basically the same play every single time. Slant route over the middle from the slot. He catches it and he, to his credit, breaks breaks a good bit of tackles after. He's really good after the catch, but that's not like really a a wide enough skill set, I guess, for me to say like he is on the wide receiver, like set it and not set it and forget it, but even like, yeah, he's a locked in like third receiver in fantasy right now. But in this matchup with the way he has played so far, I do think he's your best non Kelsey bet in this past game. Agree or disagree? Absolutely agree. I'm honestly probably way too high on rice personally, just because Mm, I love the usage when he's on the field. Again, the key is, getting him more snaps on the field, running more routes. Um, he ranks seventh on the chief uh, Chiefs offense in routes run, tied for the same number of routes run with Jarek McKinnon, which just feels wrong and dirty uh, and not okay. But, uh, you know, among these wide receivers who, you know, Marquez Vada scantling uh, has run almost 200 routes this year um, and has still seen, uh, what, 10 fewer, over 10 fewer targets than Rashi Rice. Like, yeah. When Rashi Rice is on the field, he is getting targeted uh, at a very high rate, Twenty se- or 29% of routes run. He's seeing these targets on. He's clearly, he's outplaying uh, his teammates, uh, most of them that are not named Travis Kelsey. I, I think, um, you know, especially in this matchup that has been so conducive to fantasy scoring for opposing wide receivers, I, I would not be surprised if we get, you know, a, a nice, solid, wide receiver 20 to wide receiver 24 week, uh, it, that wide receiver two performance out of Rashi Rice this week. And again, you know that, you know, the upside is there and right. maybe, maybe this, this defensive matchup for the chiefs is going to be the one that gets them back on track it, just based on the chargers weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, think about it. We know who CD lamb is. He runs those routes over the middle of the field from the slot. He was eaten on Monday night, obviously. I mean, he's about four, five, six, seven, eight tiers ahead of Rasheed Rice as a player. And I like Rasheed yeah. Rice as a player. That's just how good CD Lamb is. But um, he was kind of going off against that Chargers defense. Even Tony Pollard's catch and run was a route over the middle of the field, which, you know, they could have tackled a little bit better there. But that's the Chargers defense, right? Like that, those big plays are available to Rasheed Rice here. I keep saying with the Chiefs, Kate, that like, Come week 10, we're really like on their bye week. And after that, like that's when we're going to, I think, see a more crystallized version of what the Chiefs want to be. But it just sucks that in the meantime, it's like Chargers, Broncos, <laughs> Dolphins. I want to play somebody in all of those matchups. I think Rasheed Rice is kind of in that, especially in this murky bye week heavy uh, week here. I think Rasheed Rice is, is kind of in the mix. On the LA Chargers side, this is, a, this is another offense, Kate, where I feel like we can't like the ancillary players are pretty tough to trust. Yeah. This is kind of, you know, one of these like gut punch reality checks where you uh, look back and you say, man, um, Quentin Johnston, I wish he was one of these guys that was in the position to come in and play and be, you know, the, the player that the, the chargers drafted him to be immediately. I've said it before. We've been so spoiled with, you know, rookie wide receivers in terms of their production. Um, and, and that hasn't been the case, but you know what? Like it, Justin Herbert, it, you know, he continues to find ways to get it done. Uh, it didn't look all that pretty in week six. He's dealing with that finger injury, which he he couldn't take any snaps under center, which kind of, uh, you know, really just, it, it makes it harder, right. To, to yeah. come up with uh, a variety of plays when you can't even take a snap under center, everything came out of shotgun, um, limits the but, run game too. It, it that we don't talk about that enough. We, but it limits the run game when your quarterback can't take a snap from under center. Yeah, and this like this whole the the dynamic, um, you know, is a little bit different when that's the case. Hopefully, that finger injury, which by the way looked disgusting, um, it, like yeah. even seeing his fingers, uh, watching him play football last week with you know the glove, and he was, uh, but. It was like not pretty. It it he looked like damn look... Mickey Mouse with that big glove. Like at one yes. point he, wa- he like waved his hand around. I was like, that looks like he's like Mickey in one of them Disney World or Disneyland parades. You know, he's waving to the kids or whatever. It's like that's yes. troubling. The Chargers, uh, 
you know, not the happiest place on earth, but you know what? At least you got your franchise quarterback. You have Keenan Allen. There's a very realistic chance that what Keenan Allen posts, um, you know, I don't know, a million catches for a million receiving yards. And, and, you know, the chargers might still not be able to get it done, but this should be a matchup that's that's conducive to scoring, right? 51 or more points have been scored in all but one game uh, between the Chiefs and the Chargers mm. since Herbert was drafted. The only time these two teams, when they've met, did not combine for more than 51 points was week two of the 22, 2020 season. That was Herbert's first career start. Like, mm. this has been a very explosive matchup. Every time these two meet, um, there's a lot of yards. There's a lot of scoring. And I do think that, um, you know, our friend Austin Eckler could be in for a, a pretty solid week, even uh, against a, a Chiefs defense that I think is generally a little bit more underrated than than maybe we give them credit for. Yeah, I'm going back and forth and you're you're pushing me on because I was just about <laughs> to say, like, I'm thinking this is going to be a lower scoring game than we want it to be. But that history is there. and like. It, honestly, if Keenan Allen is doing Keenan Allen things and Travis Kelsey's a little healthier coming off um, a longer set of rest here because they played on Thursday Night Football last week, you know, this game could probably be just fine. It's just that I'm not sure. I think J Josh Palmer is actually a pretty decent wide receiver three in this matchup, just if, if it does get high scoring. But it's just tough where, where both of these offenses are right now, where we can't really trust a third receiver. We can't even trust a second receiver on the damn <laughs> chiefs at this point. So um, I don't know. This is going to, that's going to be a really interesting game. And I haven't decided right now, whether I'm thinking like over or under 47 and a half points. This is one of those things that I think um, like, this is a game that I'm not necessarily going to target uh, many players from in terms of my season long fantasy leagues. This is a matchup where if, if I'm playing some DFS and I have a little bit more luxury to just throw darts at the wall. The the scoring potential, I think, is here for, for any of these assets. It's probably just going to be trying to pick out who can do what. Now, um, on the note of the Chiefs, like the one thing giving me a little bit more hope for Rashi Rice, uh, Justin Watson, I believe, dislocated his elbow, which sounds like the yes. most painful injury of all time. Um, it, he's been like surprisingly involved in the passing game this year. So his absence might be somewhat of an uptick for Rice, especially while they're still getting, um, you know, Nicole Hardman reacclimated back into this offense. It shouldn't take That's a right, long yeah. time. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that sort of bridge week, maybe between getting Nicole Hardman fully, fully back in the mix and, and Justin Watson's disappearance. I, I just want to like, Oh man, I'm like way too high on Rashi. I just no. You know what? I I think that's an important point to close it out here on because we haven't talked about the McCole Hardman trade yet. That he's another kind of like slot gadgety over the middle guy, and that's sort of how they've been using Rashi Rice. And we know that's Kadarius Tony's game. So I think if we're going to see more Rashi Rice, it has to come as an outside replacement for Justin Watson. And I think that opens up the door there. Rashi Rice, by the way, is still. Over under receiving yard prop is 34 and a half. I've been smashing like the Rasheed Rice yes. over every single week. And I only beat it by one uh, in the Vikings game, but then really cleared it last week against the Broncos. So I think he's another good bet this week. But all right, we're we're getting ourselves way too high on Rasheed Rice. We both are, but we shall see. I like this it's was there. a conversation that I was like really trying to temper my expectations for. I was like, you know what? I'm 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 not gonna go too far in on Rashi. And then I did it. I did it again. All right. Next game up here, Sunday Night Football. What a treat. We've got this one on, on primetime here in an island game. Miami Dolphins at Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles are two and a half point home favorites. We've got a beefy 51 and a half point over under. Kate, uh, where do you want to start? I mean, this obviously is a... I know that... Let's start with the Eagles because the Dolphins are kind of simple at this point. Eagles offense hasn't totally fired off on all cylinders yet. Uh, is this the matchup where we see it against the Dolphins defense who has been generous at times this year? They've been generous at times, but I'm going to be honest, the Miami Dolphins defense has been a little bit better than I I kind of anticipated coming into this season. The Philadelphia Eagles are, are very interesting because they do, they they rank uh, very highly, I think, uh, third in total offensive yardage per game, mm -hmm. um, you know, seventh in, in points scored per game. This is a, a team that is producing. It just hasn't felt like it, which is 
really kind of a, a weird place to be. Jalen Hurts, obviously, you start Jalen Hurts, you start DeAndre Swift. Um, I think the most interesting question, you're starting, you know, A.J. Brown, of course. The biggest question for me comes at Devonta Smith, who got off to a red hot start this season. It, you know, was was producing over the first two weeks, but since then has short, largely like just kind of disappeared and and you know has been kind of a liability in your fantasy football lineups. Now he's dealing with a yeah. hamstring injury. Can you possibly trust him in a week where, you know, like even if he's playing, I would assume he'd be fairly limited. Like, can you realistically afford to sit him? And that's where I'm at. I, right. I don't know what to do with Devonta Smith. Yeah. Has there been like a second round receiver that people are happy with so far this year? Like Devonta Smith, no. T Higgins, Jalen Waddle, really like even in the sicko leagues, like which was stupid. Calvin Ridley. I was high on Calvin Ridley, <laughs> but you know, people were drafting like the second rounds it, by the end of the, the summer. Cornerback is a, is a weak spot for the Dolphins. They are 27th right now in dropback success rate allowed. I think Look, this is another week where Devonta Smith, if he's healthy, can get right. I think he's a guy that we have to monitor the practice reports all the way up until like Friday afternoon here. Yeah, I like when healthy, you can't afford to sit him. And that's probably going to be sort of that that point of of making that decision for me is is my confidence in his health. If he's not practicing Friday, like full no go um, that that that's a full yeah. no for me. Um, but Generally speaking, it's also really hard to find a guy that has legitimate wide receiver one upside Right. that, you know, it. No, none of these guys that we're going to, you know, the ancillary players you might find on your waiver wire. None of these guys are, are going to have legitimate wide receiver one potential like Devonta Smith is. So you probably can't afford to sit him. But regardless, this might be a good thing for the target share of Dallas Goddard, who's had mm-hmm. You know, plenty of of ups and downs. Obviously, got off to a very rocky start uh, in the season. Had his big breakout game, and then, it, you know, I I think we're kind of left wondering, like, it, you know, who's it going to be this week? We know it's right. going to be AJ Brown, but it it's probably only going to be one of these other receivers. And if I have to trust one of them this week, it's probably going to be Goddard. But this has been the game of roulette that we're playing. And again, both of them have too high upside to necessarily sit on any given week. Yeah, I had a really good conversation yesterday with Nate Tice about like the Eagles offense. And um, it just feels like they've tried to expand too much beyond what worked for them last year. And I think, you know, the Dallas Goddard game was a really good example of that where oh, right, we can just throw like screen passes to Dallas Goddard. And that was a total cheat code for us last year. Like some of these RPO plays that we were trying to get away from. Let's not try to get too far outside of our own identity. I think the the Eagles are learning that right now in real time. So I think this is a good get right spot for them. I'll, just last note on the Devonta Smith thing, Kate, like this is my um, weakness, I guess, as like a, a as an analyst sometimes where, yeah, I want to sit here and talk through all the possibilities of like, all right, if Devonta Smith doesn't practice on this day, maybe I'm more concerned or he, bottom line is he's on good. My own, uh, yeah, he's good. And and on my own teams, I will never, ever, 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 ever have the fortitude to <laughs> not play a guy like that. OK, so I can sit here on this podcast and like you know, pontificate about all the possibilities with Devonta Smith and what would we do if he doesn't like I'm playing the guy until, <laughs> you know, the the house burns down to the very last stud. OK, so that's where we're at. I, I think that's totally fair. And this is one of those situations where, you know, like you see the player and, and you watch him and you assume that that should translate to a billion fantasy points every single week. It doesn't. And that's sometimes the frustration with fantasy football, because, you know, there is talent. Right. And that it doesn't always translate to fantasy scoring. And that can be frustrating. But, you know, the good thing about Devonta Smith, we we have a good sample size of it translating to fantasy scoring. So it, I get it. You can never sit a guy like my rule of thumb is, will this guy make me sick to my stomach if he goes off on my bench? There are some cases where I'm like, no, I, you know, he's, I'll be fine if he goes off of my bench. But if I think in my gut, like I would be sick and, and, and nauseous if they went off on my bench, that's like my barometer for, can I afford to sit this guy? And 
Devonta Smith's like very on on the edge for me there, but the talent it it does it makes it so challenging. Good, honestly, it's good advice, uh, and I'm I'm with you on that one. Uh, a team that does score a bajillion fantasy points every week is the Miami Dolphins, and I honestly mm-hmm. feel like we don't have to discuss them really at all because it's like you know what you do with everybody that's got a Miami Dolphin little logo next to their name, you start them. Start okay, Tyree Kill. Jalen Waddle, it'll happen at some point. Like he'll have that game at some point. And and Raheem Mostert, as long as Devon Achan is out, is a must play RV one every single week. Yeah, and you know, on the the note of the you know upside of this Miami Dolphins offense, obviously we know the upside is is ginormous. But specifically for the receiving core here, specifically for the quarterback, I have Tua ranked as my overall. QB two on the week nice. up against this Philadelphia Eagles sec- Eagles secondary, which is struggling with health right now. Like they have had injury after injury in that secondary, and like they're it feels like they're they're whittling down to nothing defending the pass here. And I, I think this is going to be a very I, I don't want to say easy spot to take advantage of, but like if you're going to target the Philadelphia Eagles defensively. Um, you're not going to do it on the ground. You're not going to, uh, you know, do it with that defensive line. You're going to do it through the air where they're decimated with injury. And I think that this is just going to be uh, an absolute free for all for the Miami Dolphins. You know, it, even Raheem Mostert, who, you know, it, again, facing one of the league's best rushing defenses, it, it takes one run for Raheem Mostert. Right. It takes one broken tackle and he's gone. He's got the speed to do that. And again, with injuries in the secondary, it you might not have that that same ability to tackle in the open field. So, like, yeah, it you start all your dolphins, and I don't think you ask a, a ton of questions, but the upside this week feels tremendous. Next game up here, Monday night football. Another treat of an island game. San Francisco 49ers, seven point road favorites going into Minnesota to take on the Vikings with a 44 over under. Um, Kate, I'll tell you this, uh, probably a lot of our analysis about Devonta Smith and not having the fortitude to bench a player like that, regardless of injury designation. I think that probably applies to a lot of the 49ers that we have questions about, like McCaffrey and Debo. And right now, as we sit here, I expect those guys to play, but we shall see. So 49ers, I, I think it's a big Brandon Ayuk week this week with the way they blitz and everything. Uh, Purdy's shown that he can blitz or he can beat the blitz, which obviously the Vikings are a fan of. So I don't know if you have a ton to, to say about the 49ers, but I'm curious on your uh, take on the Minnesota Vikings offense in game one last week without Justin Jefferson. It's interesting. Um, the, the you know, passing volume of the Minnesota Vikings makes, you know, these receiving assets particularly difficult to sit for me because, it, you know, the the ability, I think, to beat the 49ers most comes through the air if you're targeting, you know, some of these outside quarterbacks. Kirk Cousins, a very good quarterback, right? It, you know, without Justin Jefferson, scored fewer than 10 fantasy points. Um, you know, this was his second game scoring 10 or fewer fantasy points over the last three weeks. Um, and it it definitely hurt the fact, like, it, particularly in your heart, that that uh, down week came on, on the back of missing Justin Jefferson for the first week. Mm-hmm. But I think there is enough talent between TJ Hawkinson, between the the ancillary wide receivers, Jordan Addison. Like, I I think this is a very talented offense. Um, You know, the passing volume is there. So like it, it, it's really hard for me to fade this offense in its entirety, even though the 49ers are a a pretty difficult matchup. The 49ers are just one of three teams along fewer than 10 fantasy points per game to quarterbacks this year. It's primetime Kirk cousins. Like I know that's like not a thing, but is it a thing? (laughs) And you know, like, if it's sort of a thing, it should definitely be a thing against the 49ers who are a terrifying defense. So like what version of this team are we going to get? I genuinely don't know. I, I think Kirk Cousins is a very safe fade, but I also don't know, you know, how many other options are are realistically mm-hmm. streamable over him at this point. Yeah, I'm pretty nervous about this offense against the 49ers defense. At least they're playing at home, pretty comfortable environment. But, you know, Jordan Addison... I still think really struggles with like physical outside cornerback play at this point. And especially as the number one outside receiver, I think that's only going to be more difficult in this matchup. Like Nick Bosa and the boys hunting Kirk cousins, you know, behind an offensive line that can be shaky. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little more nervous than you that like, we're going to get 
uh, there will be a lot of volume, but I have a feeling it's gonna be like empty calorie volume here yeah. uh, for for the Minnesota Vikings. But that does make me concerned. I still think Addison's gonna rank right around like receiver thirty for me. But we talked about Rasheed Rice. Like I like Rasheed Rice better than Jordan Addison. Oh yes, this year, even th- this week, even though. I know Addison's going to be out there for basically every single drop back. I don't have that same confidence with Rice. I just think the 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 matchup dictates it. Yeah, and I like in that specific example, you know, I think that the quality of target that that Rashi Rice, you know, like a you know he's going to be targeted when he does get those snaps on the field. The quality of that target uh given the the matchup probably going to be a bit better. I like I'm I'm with you being on the fence um and I think that this might not be a, a pretty game necessarily if you're uh you know streaming your Minnesota Vikings like I I, I also don't you know necessarily want to put a, a ton of stock in Alexander Madison either even though right. you know we we came out this week and I I think week 6 was a, a nice um moment and it was like kind of a statement game for the Vikings you know Cam Akers does not seem to be a, a significant part of their plans as many feared. It's going to be also hard to find a, a running back that's getting as much volume a, than Alexander Madison, especially, you know, even in the receiving game, been a, a big factor there. So uh, I could, I can picture this game being, being an ugly one for the Vikings. It's, uh, it, it's just hard to think about what other options you realistically have that, Mm-hmm. might have higher upside and it, again you know this is a tough matchup but like oh it's hard it's hard it's hard yeah uh last thing i expect mccaffrey to play uh but in the event he doesn't do you lean more towards elijah mitchell or jordan mason i think we have to at least mention those names elijah mitchell um you know i i think jordan mason looked great um you know obviously this this team gravitated toward toward him once Christian McCaffrey left with injury. He dominated the snaps, um, came in on that immediate drive when Christian McCaffrey was injured. But Shanahan's comments after the game have me a little bit more tepid than I was originally to start the week. Um, You know, made mention of the fact that Elijah Mitchell coming off injury, didn't get a ton of practice reps in there and but seemed kind of committal to Elijah Mitchell more so than than Jordan Mason. He kind of um, you know, minimized the fact that this was like a, a decision he made based on the talent of Jordan Mason and and really kind of came out to say that it was more of a decision based on the injury status of Elijah Mitchell. You have him, you know, another full week back in, in the mix. Um, he knows this offense very well. He's been very productive in this offense in the past. I think he's probably the safest bet, but this might be kind of a, a sloppy split um you know, I, I can picture a week where both of these guys split the workload and neither of them are, are really all that useful for fantasy because of that. Agree. All right, let's move on to the stream category. We really binged on those four binge <sighs> games, so we'll have to pick up the pace here with uh, with our stream and, and certainly the skip category. So let's jump into the first stream game here. I've got Cleveland Browns at Indianapolis Colts. The Colts are two and a half point home favorites. It's a 40 point over under. As we are recording right now, we're finding out that Deshaun Watson is practicing in full today. Um, Look, I'm not here to be like the Deshaun Watson guy. I'm, I'm not the Deshaun Watson guy, but I'll tell you what, I don't really need to see any more of PJ Walker uh, or <laughs> Dorian Thompson Robinson play football the rest of the season. So for Amari Cooper, who I think has played so well this year for like Elijah Moore as a bye week fill in, I think in a good matchup against a Colts cornerback room has been weak. I think Watson being out there makes those guys um, certainly look much better. Yeah, definitely elevates that ceiling. Like, you know, Amari Cooper gets that that huge bump, uh, you know, into that that category where, you know, he has that potential to finish as a a top five wide receiver in any given week with the way that he plays football, like just Mm -hmm. so talented. Um, You know, Deshaun Watson, he's he's definitely going to give this offense a boost, period. Um, You know, it's interesting like scenario right now going on with this this team and and the shoulder contusion like it was kind of a weird it's been a weird few weeks so like it has yeah is Deshaun Watson actually fully healthy has he been healthier than maybe you would have guessed based on the fact that he wasn't playing I don't like there there's something weird about the situation 
Um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to put a ton of stock, uh, especially if that is a shoulder injury that, you know, was nagging, uh, might limit some of his, um, you know, willingness to, to take off, scramble, run, um, might limit that portion of his game. But I think from, from a passing perspective, this is a great matchup to target, uh, against those Colts wide receivers who, you know, it, not, not much they can stop. Um, it, you know, they, <laughs> I don't know. But the the question is, right, will they need to throw the ball a ton? This is a a matchup. We officially have the news that um, Anthony Richardson's undergoing season ending shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. Like the offense under Gardner Minshew hasn't looked particularly fantastic. Um, Maybe they're able to get Jonathan Taylor, uh, you know, continue working him in, you know, the mix for increased snap share and, and increased touch totals, which should help. But like, is this a matchup that's going to be conducive to the Browns needing to throw a ton? Or is this potentially like a, a Jerome Ford week? I think it, like Jerome Ford, Kareem Hunt, both those guys are are in play. It's a rather split backfield. I think the same is true on the Colts side, S- split backfield. Like I have Zach Moss on so many teams and I've been like, Yes. waffling back and forth the last two weeks, whether I play him or I don't play him. And I've made the right call sometimes. I've made the wrong call sometimes. Uh, famously lost to Austin Eckler because I made the wrong call on on, on the podcast. Uh, anyways, it's a tough matchup for this Colts offense. As you mentioned, it hasn't looked like... I think Gardner Minshew's gotten a little overrated because he has like cool hair, cool facial hair, and wore shorts one time, <laughs> wore jorts one time. Like, you know, yeah. I think he's a fine backup quarterback, but like he is he's capable... Vibes, like dude. Like, he's a vibes he's a vibe. dude, um, but he is very viable to have a piss on his pants type of game, piss down his jorts game anytime because yeah. he's a backup quarterback like any of these guys, right? So it's a really difficult matchup. Like I'm lowering my expectations for Michael Pittman, who gets just probably too much volume for to be a fantasy sit. Like it makes me not really love Josh Downs, who I've been so high on as a player, but Concerned, I think, about the Colts offense um, moving into this one. So it's a that game's a very interesting one that I think there are some viable fantasy plays, but uh, the the quarterback questions on both sides and uh, the matchup on the Colts side is is really difficult to to kind of land like a final decision on. Let's talk NFC South here. Atlanta Falcons at Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Bucks are two and a half point favorites. Um Yikes. I mean, neither quarterback is coming off their best effort here. A three interception game for Desmond Ritter and uh, Baker Mayfield's lowest uh, adjusted yards per attempt of the season came against a good Lions defense last week. But man, Kate, if you've got a read on this game, you tell me because I have no clue. This is like it, this. I feel like this is going to probably, you know, like we're picturing this game as a stream. I could very easily picture this narrative shaking out to be like total skip category. Yeah, um, you're right. But the the interesting thing about both of these teams is that I think the the defensive line of both of these teams is is relatively strong. I don't know that either of these teams are going to do a great job of establishing the run, which might be a little bit more conducive to the pass and might be a little bit more conducive to um, just, you know, passing yards and receiving yards and, and, you know, Drake London. And maybe we get the passing game going again this week for both of these quarterbacks just based on the the relative strengths of their respective defenses. And I, I think one of those big strengths is defending the run. No, uh, there's one game every single week that, from the podcast version to the article version of this, I end up moving from stream to skip. And I'm I'm <laughs> kind of thinking it, it might be this one. But at the same time, I'm with you that the secondary weaknesses for the Bucks and the way that Drake London has played, like just get that week one disaster out of your mind because he's been just fine and solid and coming off his best performance of the season last week, uh, even with Desmond Ritter not playing well. I think he's he's in line for a solid game here. I think both Bucks receivers are in for a solid game here, but especially um, Chris Godwin could end up being the beneficiary if AJ Terrell, who's done some shadowing this year, tracks Mike Evans around the field. But these two quarterbacks make it so, and the lack of run game, especially on the Bucks side. I mean, Rashad White is just like two and a half yards per carry every single week. It's it's brutal. So uh, I can it's see hard. this one going down to the skip category. Let's talk the next one here. Pittsburgh Steelers, your Steelers at the LA Rams. Rams are three point favorites. 
43 and a half over under that 43 and a half over under is what's got me like, hmm, because the Steelers, they're not very fond of scoring points. The uh, <laughs> Los Angeles Rams, Matthew Stafford is probably the highest like difference between how he's playing in real football to his fantasy scoring outlet because he output because he hasn't thrown a lot of touchdowns. But man, Kate, there's like way too much receiver talent for me, the receiver guy to not put this game in the stream category, which is why they are here. I want to first ask you about Deontay Johnson, probably coming off injured reserve in time for to, th- for to play this game. His first since week one. For me, I think he's going to make a big difference in this offense that desperately needs like a legit separator. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think this is just going to be uh, huge in terms of of opening up this offense. Another injury potentially uh, we'll see coming back. Pat Fryermuth, uh, you know, I think one of the better receiving tight ends in the National Football League, also missed Week Five. Also coming out of bye uh, with, uh, you know, hopefully full health. I, I think having all of these assets on the field at the same time, um, yeah, like it, you know, George Pickens, uh, obviously not a separator. There's a reason that. He is the contested catch king, and it's because he's in a position to make contested catches, which generally yeah. means like he's not getting open. Right. Um, you know, and this this offense is not one that's I think dynamic enough to scheme him open. Um, you know, like that that's it, it's sideline target, sideline target, sideline target, and that that's where this offense has been uh, for the last two years. But Deontay Johnson and his ability as a route runner definitely just it changes the way you have to cover this team in general. Um, you know, I, I think he's he's definitely been Kenny Pickett's favorite target. At, you know, when Kenny Pickett is the starting quarterback, he's averaging almost two more targets than than Pickens per game hmm. so far. In in that sort of regard. I think the volume's probably going to pivot back to Johnson, which means you're going to need to to rely on some splash plays from George Pickens, but I don't necessarily know that the Rams are as good a matchup for fantasy wide receivers as I thought they would be based on the, the names, right? Like you were looking at yeah. uh, the depth chart heading into the season and you thought, boy, this has got it. Like it, nobody's ever heard of any of these guys. I think, you know, th- how many players did they have that they signed as undrafted free agents that were starting? Oh, like it was, it was insane. <laughs> and like, they've actually played fairly well, I think, to their credit. And, um, you know, the the Rams at this point in the season, um, 29th in fantasy points allowed to uh, opposing wide receivers. That's like only ahead of the Dallas Cowboys, New York Jets and Cleveland Browns. That's insane. Like, and that's, a, I feel like an underrated stat that, um, you know, nobody's, nobody's necessarily acknowledged. They've allowed just one touchdown to an opposing wide receiver so far this season. I do think that this is like not as pretty of a matchup as you would think for the Steelers. And I could picture this being another ugly game, even coming out of the bye. But boy, oh boy, are the Rams in position to just literally eat this secondary yes. to bits. Yep. And I'm scared for it. The Rams defense, it's such a good point. Raheem Morris is is a dog, and he's he's got these guys coached up really well this year. They have allowed the second most deep pass attempts in the NFL this year, according to fantasy points data, but the th- their 35.4% completion rate allowed is uh, inside the top 12 uh, in terms of being good. Uh, and same thing with their yards per attempt. Like teams have been trying to get them on deep passes and it hasn't been working so far. They thought this the year. same they thing have- that I did. Like this exactly is going to be a right. place to target them in it hasn't worked. And that like, yeah. it, again, probably one of like, if I had to list out the top 10 biggest surprises of the 2023 season, it's probably going to start uh, or or at least get to quickly this Rams defense. And I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's coaching. Um, and, you know, it, again, it, it hasn't worked out when these teams are, um, you know, trying to, to poke the bear there in the secondary, it's just not working out. So not loving really any of these Pittsburgh wide receivers. You know, the again, a, a big issue for the Steelers has been their propensity to target the sideline over and over and over again. That's not going to work here. Not going to work here at all. And again, they they haven't shown a willingness to target that middle of the field, which is where, you know, you get Pat Fryermuth involved and 
I, I think you can scheme some things open there, but if their playing calling isn't going to cater to that, I think the the Steelers are going to be in a, a spot to struggle. I don't like George Pickens this week. Um, highlighted him as a, a fade on my weekly bus article here at Yahoo. So check that out. Um, you know, I, I have some legitimate concerns about, you know, the, the, the overall upside here. I'm comfortable starting Deontay Johnson and especially in a full PPR matchup, just knowing that there's a very realistic chance he sees 10 plus targets in this game. Uh, if they allow him to, to play a full allotment of snaps, but outside of that, I'm looking elsewhere. And let's just have a quick moment of honesty on the Rams running backs. We don't know. No, we don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe that changes by Sunday morning. Uh, Andy and I do videos every Sunday morning, so you can check out that, that video series there on our socials, on the app, every, the whole thing. We might have a better read on the Rams running backs. Probably won't. So let's not even bother talking about them <laughs> right now. Let's move on to the next team here. Arizona Cardinals at Seattle Seahawks. Um, I think this is a great bounce back spot for the Seahawks offense. Rough cornerback room uh, there for the Arizona Cardinals. It's like this close to really just connecting for Geno Smith and Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. And we even saw JSN get more involved coming off the bye. So I'm looking for a bounce back effort from my Seahawks pass games, uh, passing game assets here, Kate. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really nice spot for the entire offense in, in general, like passing, rushing, receiving like this. This, I, I think, is a, a solid matchup just to um, get on the same page. And and like you're right, it feels like maybe the um, like a lot of near misses and and. You know, it feels like this offense is just this close from exploding. You know, they have the talent to um, literally at every offensive position. And, you know, Geno Smith, I think, you know, he's maybe not playing lights out like he did last season, but he's still playing pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, DK Metcalf, uh, you know, the the frustration is there. He wants the ball. Um, he wants to get this pass attack moving. And the, the Cardinals have not been a, a bad matchup from, you know, against which to do that. Any concern that this is going to be like just an ugly divisional game? Uh, always possible the NFC West is such a weird division, but um, 31st does the Arizona Cardinals rank in terms of dropback success rate allowed. The only w worst team is the Denver Broncos who aren't, who are an unserious defense all, <laughs> all the way around. So I do think it's a good bounce back spot for the Seahawks. I think the bring back here with the Cardinals is interesting, Kate, because they kind of started to fall off a little bit. Josh Dobbs is, is starting to kind of, I wouldn't say get exposed, but he's just not playing as clean and careful as he has been earlier to start the season. But honestly, from a fantasy perspective, like we care about Marquise Brown and he's going to be volatile, but the opportunity is there and the talent is there. And then like Trey McBride took a step over Zach Ertz last week, and that would be great to continue to see that. But I do think the Seahawks defense, like, if one team is going to muck it up here, it's going to be the Seahawks defense, which I think is underrated and like has a pretty good secondary. Yeah, their secondary, I, like, dang. Um, you know, you have Devin Witherspoon, who very might, very well might be the defensive rookie of the year with the way he's playing. Like, propensity for splash plays, the the secondary just generally underrated. And yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, especially this being a divisional game, this is a, a familiar opponent, even if it is a, a new coaching staff. Like it, these two teams have crossed paths quite often. Um, you know, the I, I think the absence of James Conner is just so huge for yeah. this offense in general. Like I, I think that threat of having him on the field, this is some of the best play football we've seen James Conner play. And I've been a big James Conner fan for a long time. I love his running style. He's so tough. Uh, tough but explosive and you know I I think he's big reason this offense looked a little bit more competent than you had expected coming out of this season and they're not going to have that so I, I think just generally speaking things could get ugly pretty quickly here for the Arizona Cardinals and you know the the Seahawks, I feel like, have this this game in the bag, which probably means the Cardinals are going to flip it on its <laughs> head. The Cardinals head will win, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, like, absolutely in dominant fashion, this is going to be a crazy game. But, you know, I think there are just so many uncertainties outside of, like, Marquise Brown that there are better options elsewhere that aren't facing a, a talented and underrated defense. Um, 
I, I just don't think this is an opportunity. The run game was a mess last week. Uh, you had Amari DiMarcato like leading the team in snaps. You had Keontae Ingram leading the team in carries. It's, it was a dis- like it. There was no way. You had Damian Williams come out of the woodwork, uh, coming right off the practice squad into a, a role like. The run game was a mess. This whole team is kind of a mess. But yeah, you you play Marquise Brown, and I think that's pretty much the the best start throw that you're going to get on this team. But even that, you know, I think we know the ceilings ceilings high, but the floor is low. I mentioned those very unserious Denver Broncos. They are mm-hmm. in our last game of the stream category here, and honestly. They're not here for their for themselves, okay? They're here for what they can do for the team on the other side of the field. Because mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, Kate, like I'm even in this week where we've got all these teams on by and we got all these injuries, I don't think there is one player on the Denver Broncos, unless maybe Cortland Sutton, if you are desperate, that you can consider playing. Because it's like a committee approach at receiver, it's a committee approach in the backfield. Russell Wilson's coming off his worst game of the year. Sean Payton is a is a is a disaster. Like there's nothing I have any confidence in on the Denver side of it. So let's stick on Green Bay here going against that defense that's been, like I said, super, super beatable. Aaron Jones yeah. should be back. Or like he should be back. He's had so much time to come off this hamstring injury. Um I I my expectations for Aaron Jones, if he's out there and close to hundred percent, are very high in this matchup, as is my ceiling projection, but no floor projection for Christian Watson as well. Yeah, I'm super, super high on Aaron Jones. All things seem like to be indicating that Aaron Jones, he feels great. He should be good to go. Had the bye week. You're grateful for the timing of that. But like Aaron Jones, all things considered, if he is even 90% healthy, I think is going to eat this defense alive. Um, You know, it, it doesn't matter what position you're talking about like the Denver Broncos probably lead the league in yards allowed to it it just yeah (laughs) across the board and Aaron Jones like we know his ceiling we know his his touchdown scoring potential um you know the last time we saw uh Aaron Jones going up against the Lions which we've already talked about as as a very underrated uh rushing Mm -hmm. defense Broncos are allowing just under 36 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs over 200 scrimmage yards two scrimmage touchdowns per game this is such a sweet spot i think this is also a fine matchup to stream aj Dillon, even though he's um you know struggled generally speaking had a nice game ahead of the bye which made you feel a little bit a little bit encouraged that he wasn't playing like total garbage um but i think this is a sweet spot for literally anybody on this this you know entire packers offense which uh, you know, the the biggest question, obviously, is the the passing game and wh- who's going to be the focal point of this game. Uh, you know, this matchup, again, could be conducive to any of them scoring a ton of fantasy points. Yeah, I think this is the week to really decide how Christian Watson's going to go the rest of the year. Like, is he going to be a funnel target in this pass game or is he going to be a vertical shot player, which... My instincts on him as a player is that he fits more closer to a vertical shot, high volatile wide receiver, too, than he is as like a legit NFL number one wide receiver. And, you know, that's obviously good news for Romeo Dobbs, who could be a bi week fill in uh, as the number two, like number two, quote unquote, maybe top receiver on this team. So, all right, let's move into the skip category here, Kate. We got three very skippy games to talk about in the skip category. So we can be quick here. Las Vegas Raiders. Three point favorites going into Chicago to right. face the Bears. Tyler Bajent versus Brian Hoyer, maybe in this one. I'll tell you what, I'll give Bajent some credit. He was not nearly as much of a disaster as people like kind of want to make him out to be. And he, I don't know, there's a weird like Bajent fan club on, on the <laughs> internet uh, that will throw his college stats at you in a second. So um, honestly, though, all we care about uh, on these two teams. Well, obviously, Josh Jacobs in the backfield. Roshan Johnson, if he gets out there, would be a, it would be a nice matchup for him as I think the guy they probably are starting in the backfield. But like, what do we do if we get backup quarterbacks with DJ Moore and on the other side, Devontae Adams, uh, who's frustrated right now, and obviously Jacoby Myers, my dude, who's eating up targets. Yeah, in this matchup, like, you know, this very well could be, I think, um, for the Raiders, maybe we'll see a O'Connell again, which... We, you know, got a sample of him in week four and it, 
it wasn't pretty. He got brutalized. He, I, I think, took seven sacks that game, three fumbles, two fumbles lost. Like, that was a very ugly game. But you know who was, you know, still seeing a lot of targets in that game was Devontae Adams had 13 targets um, from Aiden O'Connell so far this year. The next highest uh, player targeted by Aiden O'Connell has been uh, Josh Jacobs, who had a very heavy involvement as a receiver. Now, I think what that translates to is I'm just going to toss the ball to my first read. Um, Mm -hmm. If my first read doesn't appear open, I'm probably too scared to continue reading the rest of the field. I'm just going to chuck it down to the running back, which means I'm not comfortable starting Jacoby Myers, despite the fact that dude's playing out of his mind and his connection with Jimmy Garoppolo is clearly very strong um, and they have great chemistry and like... Every week you fire up Jacoby Myers, unless that week you're not having, you know, a, a viable starting NFL quarterback, in which case I'm tempering expectations. Yes. Uh, we just don't even know who's going to play quarterback for the Raiders at this point. Like, cause that is still very unclear. And I agree with you that Garoppolo in, Myers in. Otherwise, it is a little concerning here for Jacoby Myers, even though he's dominated the you know, first read targets the last couple of weeks, uh, which is obviously, like I said, Devontae Adams is a little frustrated. But uh, Michael Mayer is on the radar as well. Uh, I would feel pretty good about him if Jimmy Garoppolo is out there, not as much with the uh, other backup quarterbacks there. Okay, so let's move on to our next game here in the skip category. Buffalo Bills, eight and a half road favorites going into face whatever's left of the New England Patriots with a 40 and a half <laughs> over under. I will say this. These are pretty simple teams here, Kate, because... It's like we know what the Bills are, and then the Patriots, it's just no, 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 no. We're not starting any of these guys, except Ramondre Stevenson did have an 18% target share last week, and I think in this matchup probably is back on the RB2 radar. Yeah, I I think that's fair. The Buffalo Bills are kind of an interesting defense right now. They've suffered a lot of injuries, uh, which Mm -hmm. has been kind of brutal for them, especially for how well they've come out to play to start the season. Like this defense has looked so dominant. And if they had everybody healthy, you know that this would probably be right up there with the 49ers in terms of, of you know, the the caliber defense. Um, but that, again, hasn't been the case. They're not healthy. They just continue to be decimated by injury. Um, I think that should put Ramondre Stevenson back in, in a viable spot. Came off um, just an absolute brutal stretch and actually gave you a a little bit of production last week. I'm still rolling with him again because we're in a bye week or or we're in a a week with six teams on bye. We've got a ton of injuries at the running back position. I don't think there are many teams that are probably like in a position where they can afford to sit Ramondre Stevenson, but I think it should be fine. It like I, 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 it should be fine. That's what it should be fine, fine, right? Like that's the fine. thing. Even even in a best case scenario, so like it, yeah. it'll be fine, uh, not great. James Cook is at least interesting in this matchup to me too. Where you know Damian Harris, will, we are obviously rooting for the best for him. We'll see what that situation uh, unfolds as. Latavius Murray has given them like. I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent sure why they love like running Latavius Murray. I get why they like him in pass protection. I know he's like rushing EPA is rather high, so maybe maybe that's it. Maybe that's what they're looking at here. He gets them in positive down and distance, but um, I think James Cook is solidly playable here. And then otherwise, in the pass game, it's like you know what Gabe Davis is. Steph Diggs is the man, and we'll see if Josh Allen's injury is serious because obviously that is what derailed this team last year. That's sort of my my biggest question. Um, you know, like this. Patriots team, you know, not necessarily the the high flying offense that everybody expected under Mac Jones, um, but you know it it's not uh, it's not ideal when your quarterback has a shoulder injury, especially one uh, like Josh Allen who has so much upside, especially because of his athleticism, his gift as a runner. So, like, it, depending on how that shoulder injury actually feels, um, like obviously you're you're it's not changing any of your decisions, but it might limit Allen's upside just a little bit. uh, If that shoulder injury is of concern, if there's like a pain tolerance issue there, Um, just in case that does, you know, uh, affect some of his willingness to take off and run and take some of those big hits, which we know Allen's, you know, willingness to take some of these big hits is part of the problem in the first place, right? Like 
that that is my only real question. But again, I guess it, it's not really affecting your start sit decisions for this this right. entire offense. So like it's kind of a moot point and you just if if Allen's ceiling is a little bit lower while he gets back to a hundred percent uh with that shoulder, then you you still play him because his You live with it. Uh yeah, his eighty five uh ninety percent is still better than like a hundred percent of quarterbacks in the NFL. Not a hundred, but ninety nine. Like yeah. 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 You that, get it. That, that seems that, math wise that works out. Math. For me. Um, it's analytics. Take it. <laughs> Last and quite possibly very least is Washington oh. Commanders at New York Giants. Kate, it's the sack off. Uh, that's what this <laughs> game is going to be called because Sam Howell's on pace for 96 sacks uh, so far this year, which I just can't stop saying. And Daniel Ouch. Jones, his he missed a game, so he's not on pace for this, but his 17 game pace would be on a per game basis 95. I mean, oh my God. outrageous. And they just put another offensive lineman out for the season this year, did the New York Giants. Um, we don't even know if Daniel Jones is going to play in this game, right? Uh, <laughs> Tyrod Taylor actually made the offense look functional last week, which should be yeah. scary for the New York Giants. But I don't really... What do you What do you do here? I mean, from a fantasy angle, it's it's like kind of been both, to, both disappointing units, even if Sam Howell has given you numbers in his own right. I am still stuck on those uh, sack totals. Um, it's rough. Or that oh my god! Like I, I can only imagine sitting here in my cozy, comfy chair talking about football. What taking ninety sacks would feel like, but I have to imagine it wouldn't feel all that great. So, like uh, you know, we we've got to clean some things up there on both sides of the ball. Uh, but you know, commanders. I actually, you know, the the Giants. They're not. They're they're a beatable defense. Um, you know, Sam Howell, he's been a, a high volume passing option, you know, especially in the second half. Again, hasn't been pretty. This is a matchup you're going to want to skip if you're starting any of these guys. But um, Sam Howell, his his passing volume has just generally been um, something worth streamable. Like he mm-hmm. he's finished as a top six fantasy quarterback each of the last two weeks. Um, now he's facing the Giants who, you know, they're they're not a great team when it comes to achieving pressure. Most of Sam Howell's touchdown production has come when he's not under pressure from a clean pocket. They might be able to afford that if he can just get the dang ball out of his hands on time uh, and not hold on to it forever. But I, I think Sam Howell, like, I, you know, I, I was taking a look at waivers today and, and some of the data of uh, who's available and what percentage of the leagues. And let me tell you, Sam Howell is available in way too many leagues for the fact that he's generally speaking, been pretty well. 44% of Yahoo leagues he's still available in. And this is a guy that's been a top 12 quarterback in four of six games this week, uh, this whole season. No, he has been productive. Uh, he's putting him in a lot of positions where they have to keep uh, throwing because <laughs> of the, mm-hmm. all the sacks taken. Volume, baby. Volume, hey, it, it, it works. Um, I think it's a good spot for Terry McLaurin. Obviously, he's an every week starter anyways. Like Curtis Samuel's a bye week fill-in based on how productive he's been. And We'll just have to see what happens with my guy Jahan Dotson. Um, Who hey, is uh, now holding uh, holding kicks? Is that I can't what? Even, I, I, will, I refuse to engage with that, Kate. Listen, <laughs> it's it's week seven. We have been crap has been thrown at us, you know, from all different directions. I I have to protect my my mental space, and you know, <laughs> you can say anything you want to say if you have thoughts on the Jahan Dotson holder video. I cannot like for my own mentals. I cannot engage with that on the internet. I mean, it's silly, but you know what? Like the it just from a, a perspective of maybe you know spinning this in a positive light for another guy, Curtis Samuel, uh, also available in way too many leagues. Fifty one yes. percent of Yahoo leagues um, allowing the twelfth most fantasy. Uh, the Giants are allowing the twelfth most fantasy points per game to the wide receiver position, and. Debo Samuel, he's been scoring touchdowns. He's the wide receiver 25 this year. Uh, you know, he should be on rosters. And if you're going to be able to start Curtis Samuel in any level of confidence this year, like this is the matchup. This is the week that you're starting him for. It's so funny because like I've been a uh, Terry McLaurin guy. I've been a Curtis Samuel guy for a long time. You know, not everybody can win. 
and John Dotson's the loser here so far. But I am excited that Curtis Samuel, my dude, is producing pretty well. Um, I also think, by the way, it's not posted yet, but whatever the prop is for Jalen Hyatt, I could see taking the over just because he's a speed guy. There's no volume here or whatever, but this is a rough secondary. So I don't know. There is some. This could be a sloppy, bad shootout here between these two teams just based on the way the defenses are, and there is some talent on – the Washington side, and you know, we'll see what happens with New York. But overall, I think for your mental space, go ahead and skip this game. Well, Kate, yeah, this yeah. has Don't been watch incredible. It. <laughs> yeah. Don't watch yeah. it. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. But but maybe there'll be some fantasy points out here. Well, Kate, yeah. I never want to skip the podcast that you're on. Um, we really appreciate you jumping on here to preview what was a messy week seven. And I think we definitely uh we look, we looked at it from all angles. Hopefully, the people out there will be more prepared now. Yeah, for sure. Everybody, please, uh, you know, be be safe out there with your roster decisions, and and you know, don't don't get too crazy. I know it's going to be uh, a dire straits week, but we're here for you. Uh, we we yeah, Yahoo's got like the best of the best here providing fantasy advice. I you know, I'll I'll include myself in that uh, as Good, as a guest should. on the podcast <laughs> in our uh, our weekly bust column over at Yahoo, which uh, should be going out this afternoon. So uh, be sure to check that out. Well, definitely make sure to check out Kate's uh, bus column and, you know, then she can make you feel bad about these guys that you might just have to start anyways because it's a yeah. really messy <laughs> week in week seven. But at least you'll feel worse about it going into it. Well, I feel better coming out of this episode going into week seven myself. Very excited. It's, it, we've got some good, good games on the slate here. We've just got to get through some of the slogs. Uh, luckily, the good ones are on primetime and in island spots. But that is going to do it for this podcast today. Be sure to tune in first thing Monday morning to hear Scott Pianowski and I break down everything that happened in this very interesting, very mysterious week seven. Until then, we're out. <laughs>